let's uh, let's sing um, page 12. He's coming back. And if you guys have any uh, requests, uh, get them ready back. He's coming back on a simple
Draw us close to you. I want you to notice this little town, Shunem. And I want you to notice that south of Shunem is Mount Gilboa. That's where our story is taking place today. To the north. Now something else I want you to notice, I want you to notice the area of Dan over here. Dan, one of the twelve tribes, lost his land to the Philistines. Philistines way down here. But in our story today, they're about to fight with Saul. And they're camped way up there at Shunem. How these guys got from here to way up there is a surprise to everybody. You have to figure, okay, hey, we're God's people. We got God on our side. How in the world did the devil get way up there? <laughs> Sometimes we behave worse than the devil. And so God has to pick and choose. Who does he side with? The bad guy or the guy who is worse than the bad guy? We see that this happens quite often. For example, the, the, the children of Israel, when the Assyrians come in to take them captive, they say, hey, why are you bringing the Assyrians our direction? They're worse than us. And God says, no, they're not. And then when the Babylonians come in, the king said, why are you using the Babylonians? They're like the worst people on the whole planet. And God said, no, they're not. Well, who is? You. That's why I'm bringing them in. Sometimes we are worse than those that we call bad because we should have known better. And a guy who really should have known better is the king camped out there at Gilboa. A young man by the name of Saul. Now I read this to you because I want you to see how bad things go for him. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines. They're losing the battle. They fell down, slain at Mount Gilboa. They're at this mountain right here. They came into that valley of Jezreel. You probably heard that a lot. Uh, when we're going through Hosea. The valley of Jezreel is a place where God says, I have enough of you. You are not my people. And the valley of Jezreel is a place of punishment for God. When he's had enough of you, he takes you to the valley of Jezreel and gives it to you. Look now where the Philistines are chosen to fight with the Israel. They chose to fight in the valley of Jezreel. How did they know that? Maybe God brought them up there. Because they came all the way from the coast down here. Goliath of Gath, remember him? Gaza, down here. Ashdod. You know this one, John, but you get that in the New Testament, right? All the way up the, there's the valley of Megiddo, where the end times is going to be fought. Straight across from Megiddo, there's Shunem. Between Shunem and Mount Gilboa, the Valley of Jezreel. Guess where the Jews come down to fight? The Valley of Jezreel. The place where God hands out punishment. Not a smart move on their part. I'd have gone to be some place that God likes. Like, I'd say, hey, let's go to Bethlehem, the house of bread. You know? Hey, let, let's go over here. Remember where God blessed us in Bethel? Let's go to Bethel, the house of God. No, let's go to the valley of Jezreel where God's going to hand out punishment. Probably thinking that God's going to hand out punishment to the Philistines. But it's where God deals with his own children. Look, remember, I told you, you thought you had it bad. You ain't had nothing yet. All right, they've lost the battle. That's bad enough. They're running, and as they're running, they're being killed. That's embarrassing. Because now you, not only are you a lousy fighter, but you're a slowpoke runner, and the bad guys are catching you. The 
Philistines followed hard after Saul and after his sons. The sons are going to pay for the sins of the father on this particular day. And the Philistines slew Jonathan, one of the great heroes of the Bible. One of the men who loved God. In fact, the guy that David learned how to love God from. And this godly man died because he had an ungodly father. Faithful to his dad, went with his dad, loyal to his dad, died that day. Not just him, but a been a dad. Malachi Hua, they all, he died too. Verse 3, and the battle went sore against Saul, and finally the archers, hey, let's quit chasing these guys. So the archers come into play, and they hit him, and he was wounded by the archers, the arrows. They just phew, covered the sky with them. Next thing you know, Saul's got a bunch of them in his back. Custer's last stand. You ever see that movie? Where he's standing there, bless his heart, shooting all them lousy engines, and he's taking an arrow here and an arrow there. Do you know he was the first guy down in the actual battle? They didn't even know that that was custom until after the battle. Because he was the first guy to die, and the Indians, the Sioux, didn't think Custer could be killed. So later they said, let's go find out who that lousy jerk was that came and attacked us. And said, oh! His wife, he had an Indian wife there in the tribe, and she recognized her husband. It was a marriage of a treaty that when he married her, it said, we had never attacked you. So the last person on the whole earth they ever expected to come down that hill was the old blonde here himself. And so a 12-year-old Indian boy, first shot, boom, he's gone. That's what threw his people all in disarray. They didn't know what to do because his people didn't think he was touchable either. He had survived the Civil War. Surprised everybody. And so here we have another surprise. The king thought he was going to go out and maybe win this one. Next thing you know, he's lost his son. He's lost the battle. He's lost his men. He's lost his sons. Now an arrow takes him out. So Saul's going to say to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me. Don't let the bad guys do it. I'd rather die from you, somebody I know. You won't torture me in the process. So he did. And when the men of the valley saw that they fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their cities and they fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. You see all this area up around here? They lost that whole area. Lost it. Not only where they were fighting, but all the territory around. Now the Philistines are moving in. Israel is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Let me show you what's happening here. Oh, I got to you down this other You saw all the land that they own. Now they're trapped down between. They own down here basically toward Hebron and just above Shechem is all the land. Kind of, you see this area called Ephraim? You know why God refers to Israel as Ephraim? Because that's about all they got left. Of all this land, they got this left. David's going to come in and clean everybody's clock. But for now, they're losing and losing and losing. <coughs> His sons are dead. Saul is slain there in Gilboa. Look at verse 9. And they came and they stripped him and took his head. I, I mean, maybe it don't matter to you once you're dead, but still, it's just a gruesome thought. They took his armor, they took his head, they carried them through their own land of Philistine down here, and they put his armor in one temple, his head, they paraded it through the city and said, look what we did. Our gods are stronger than their gods. God said, well, that's not really true just yet. Be careful what you're bragging about. They put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the 
temple of Dagon. Dagon's an odd uh, deity. He's half fish and half man. He's got the head of a fish and the body of a man. What's so funny is this is the same God that Nineveh worships. And so when we are told that Jonah came up out of the mouth of that giant fish, everybody listened to him, that's why there was a great revival in Nineveh. Because here their God, the half fish, half man, and now you got this big fish delivering a man to you who's saying, wrong God, got their attention, brought about a great revival. But right now, they're losing everything. They're going to be down to Ephraim. Out of all that God gave them, God gave them so much. And now they've got so little of it left. And you have to ask yourself, how come? Look at verse 13. Our text really is taken out of verses 13 and 14. This is the reason. 13 and 14 are the reason why they've got nothing left but Ephraim. Look what he says. So Saul died for his transgressions that he committed. Not just Saul, but all those men who followed him. All those cities that were taken over. This is a much worse case than it looks. Saul died because of the transgressions which he committed against the Lord. Not only against the Lord, but look at this. Against the word of the Lord. You do not violate God. You do not violate His Word. Period. End of statement. How did He do it, you might ask? Well, God has to tell you. He kept not the Word of the Lord. That's His problem. Here it is, black and white. He said, I don't want to keep it. One area God said, here's something. Kings are nice to have, but only the priest can offer a sacrifice. Saul said, yeah, but I'm a big king. So I can, and when the prophet didn't show up, he thought he could offer. And God said, I told you not to touch that. Yeah, but we're getting ready to go to war. I need to make a sacrifice to you. No, you come to me my way. See, here's the problem with religion. Everybody says, and you hear it all the time, oh, I'll come to God in my own way. No, you won't. You will either come by Jesus Christ or you don't get in, period. <coughs> That's why I tell you all the time, my job is to tell you what the book says. My job is not to interpret it. There is no interpretation needed. It is now written in English. Yes, when it was written in Greek, we needed interpreters to get it into English. We got it in English. You don't need an interpreter anymore. You just need to apply what it says. Amen. We're in the state we're in because people still say, well, you know, the Bible's up to, you know, everybody interprets the Bible their own way. No, they don't. They apply it their own way. What God said, God, let me tell you, how smart do you think God is? Could God tell you what he's thinking if he wanted to? So if God wrote this book down, don't you suppose he put it plain enough that you and I could figure it out? He held Saul accountable for not keeping the book. So he must have figured Saul could understand it. And Saul was just a shepherd boy's son, or the, the son of a shepherd. Not a college kid. So if God is saying, listen, an uneducated shepherd boy can understand my word, all you high school grads out there can certainly do it. So how come there's so much problem? Because people don't want to. It's not that Saul didn't understand what the book said. He didn't want to keep it. Look what God says. So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord and even against the word of the Lord which he kept not. How did he violate God's word? <coughs> Look at this. By asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit. How do you know Saul knew that that was bad? 
Well, if you remember your first Samuel, and if you remember chapter 28 of first Samuel, we read these words. Now, Samuel was dead. This, by the way, verse 28, is dealing with the same battle we just talked about up here. Let me look at, look at verse 20. I'm going to go up to verse 1 so you can see that this is what's going on in his mind the night before he dies. It came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight Israel. And Achish said unto uh, David, uh, Know assuredly that thou shalt not go with us to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou knowest that thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of my head forever. So David is hanging out with the Philistines because Saul's trying to kill him. So David and his men are hanging out over here in Ziklag. The Saul is up there fighting the Philistines. David's at peace with them down over here. Temporarily anyway. Now Samuel was dead. And all Israel was lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away all those familiar spirits. See that? The Bible says to do it. Saul had put away all the familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Because he knew that God said to do it. However, all of a sudden now he needs to talk to God. So he goes to God and says, God, I'm about ready to fight the Philistines here at Shunem. And God doesn't say a word to him. Uh, God, you there? Uh, Lord? Uh, you, Jehovah. Anybody up there? He comes to his men and says, listen, we're about ready to fight the Philistines and I can't get a hold of God. Here's what I need. Remember all those people we kicked out of the land? I need one of them. So they go to Endor and talk to a woman with a familiar spirit. Back, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13. So Saul died for the transgression, transgression, which he had committed against the Lord. Which transgression against the Lord? He did not keep the word of the Lord. In what area did he not keep the word of the Lord? He, by asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit. Oh, the old palm reader. The old guy and gal on TV all the time that'll tell you what the ghosts are saying to you. For a buck and a half or whatever they charge you. You, I, you ain't allowed to. You ain't allowed to. <coughs> Here, this, I, I'm just saying what it says right here. Also, for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of that spirit. <coughs> he went to her to inquire of the dead. I'd like to know what the dead are thinking, at least in this particular battle. Ain't allowed to do it. God said that's why he killed him. That's why he wouldn't talk to him. You ever have trouble talking to God? You ought to find out what you might be violating in the book. It might not seem all that bad to you. Here's the real sin. Look at verse 14. And inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he, God, slew him. Wait a minute. I thought you just said the night of this battle he went and he talked to God. Yes, he did. The night of this battle. Where was he all the rest of the time? Doing his own stuff. His own thing. Listening to himself. God said, this man didn't inquire of me. You and I have read that he inquired of the Lord and the Lord wouldn't answer him. Just because it's an emergency on your part doesn't constitute an emergency on his part. See, this is 
the, what God is trying to teach us is it's all about our relationship. If my kids never come to me, if, if Nathaniel never darkens my doorstep, and then one day he comes in and says, Dad, I need some ready cash. I'm going to pray for you, son, that you get it. However, should he bring my little granddaughter over from time to time? Let me spoil her rotten occasionally. And then says, oh, Dad, by the way, this poor little child ain't got no milk in the house. Woe be tied. I say, son, here's my little blue card. You go get her all the milk she needs. And buy yourself a suit, too. <laughs> the point is, we have a relationship. A relationship. My mare can come and she can say, hey, crap off. We need it. Fine, go get it. Mr. Christian comes by and he says, Hey, Grandpa, who gets it? JD comes by. They all know I'm a sucker for their face. However, stranger stops me on the street and says, Hey, I need ten bucks. So do I. <laughs> when you get it, you let me know I'm going to the same place you did. I don't give strange people ten dollars. I just don't. Why? Because they're strange people to me. I have no relationship. And so God says, hey, Saul's a stranger to me. I have no relationship. David, on the other hand, who's right now living down here with the bad guys. God's going to move him over just a little bit and bring him over here to Hebron. And then he's going to take him from Hebron and bring him up to Jerusalem and make him king of the whole show. And then he's going to give him all the land, clear into Syria, from Egypt to Syria. God's going to give David, and he's going to beat back everybody. All of a sudden, these Philistines right here, only because he liked their king, David's going to let them keep a little piece. They still got that little piece, and they're still fighting over it, launching rockets over each other's heads to this very day. He didn't keep the word. That's what God said. I killed him because he didn't keep my word. Which tells us that God must think his word rather important. Listen, you want to go talk to spirits instead? Go right ahead. And when you need help and you don't find it from me, and the arrows are flying, and your, 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 your men that you trusted in are dying, and it costs you everything you had because you didn't want a relationship. See, we don't mind God being around if he's a real good genie. If we could rub God's belly and get three wishes, we'd keep him around. But what gives God the right to ask me how to live? probably get his God. And see, that's the problem. The world will admit there's a God if he will give them stuff. But when he says, this is how you should live, they say, not a God I know. Today, everybody was out there talking to a holy man from Tibet. The Dalai Lama. Making a big to do about a holy man. I, 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 I listened, I, his accent was so hard, I couldn't say, I couldn't tell you what he said. He could have said good stuff. But it all came down to the same thing it's all inside you. No, it's not. The only thing inside you is sin. In me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. He might be holy in his own eyes, but I thought he's got a long way to go before God approves of him. God only agrees of Jesus Christ, period. We only get in because God thinks we look like Jesus. He sees Christ in me. So, Praise the Lord. So, why did Saul die? He violated God's word. You say, but there wasn't a long list of things. No. But God said, you didn't inquire of me. And you didn't keep my word. He 
kept not the word of the Lord. This is a huge failure. I, I cannot overstate it. He kept not the word of the Lord. If I don't read God's word, how can I keep God's word? I can't. That's why in the morning as I'm going to work, in the afternoon as I'm coming home from work, I've got the New Testament playing on my cassette player, or I guess I call them CDs now. It holds, my little thing holds six CDs, just enough to cover everything from Romans to Jude. It doesn't get Revelation, but it gets Romans through Jude, and then I put Revelation in that area. But I get all the letters of Paul, all the letters of John, all the letters of Peter, and Jude and James in there too. And several times a week I've heard them whining. Because how else am I going to keep his word? I can't keep it if I don't know it. I can't know it if I don't read it. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. So biblically, I'm okay because even though I'm not reading as I drive, I'm hearing. And the promise was that faith would come to me by hearing. i got to say, I've probably got as good a faith as anybody else. Maybe not the greatest in all the world, but hey, I would say mine's pretty good. Why? Because I hear it. I hear it. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. How do I hear God? Because I'm listening to his word. Important. What God saw in trouble? Would listen. Would listen. Where is he today? Dead and gone. How many people gave up on their Bible and are no longer with us today. How many people used to be members or part of this church or other churches never really interested in the Bible? Just wanted to be whatever glory they could get within the walls of the church. And now they're gone. Many of us could sit there and lament people that used to be stalwart and now vagabonds. It's important. So when you are tempted to set your Bible down, you might want to read that. It will do us some good. All right.